company builds a great product, I help to build a great company. We focus on giving a lot of detail in our job specs. Um, we're going to give a lot of transparency on everything else that's happening in the company. Public handbook, again, in Notion. What tangible things we can actually do to measure what great is and how we work towards this, uh, especially this is by way of our value proposition. We care about people delivering results and we care about enabling our people to get those results. That's really it. So if that means everyone uh, gets to work from wherever they want, We're here with Thomas Forstner, Director of People and Talent at Juro, an all-in-one contract automation platform that enables legal and business teams to manage contracts in one unified workplace. Thomas is a strong people and talent leader, and I am excited to have him on today. Thomas, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Could you start by telling us more about Juro as a company, your, your role there, and any previous experiences that led you to the role? Sure. Um, so Juro, as you said, is an, is an all-in-one contract automation platform. Uh, we're on a mission to effectively dethrone Microsoft Word and DocuSign and become the default way to agree contracts online. I joined two years ago, um, originally as talent acquisition lead, and today I'm the director of people and talent, uh, which means that I'm overseeing the whole candidate and employee lifecycle. Before that, I was um, in talent partner roles in two other startups, uh, Algolia and Paddle. Uh, both of them uh, became unicorns in the last year. So that obviously makes me super happy, especially seeing that a lot of the people that I brought to the business are still there and thriving. Now, your team has implemented choice first work. Talk to us about what that means, how you came to this decision, and how your team approaches hybrid work. Sure. Um, so before I go into um, what choice first work means, I think the, the, the way that we got there in the first place is um, because we've seen really three things um, that were highlighted during the pandemic in the past two years. Number one, everybody's different with regards to how, when and where they do their best work. Number two, some companies turned out to be better equipped to deal with this and some worse. And number three, no company that is aiming for some sort of hybrid approach today has figured this out yet. Everybody's <laughs> experimenting, no matter what the company says. And I think our approach to work, not just hybrid, but like work in general, has always been pretty simple. We care about people delivering results and we care about enabling our people to get those results. That's really it. So if that means everyone uh, gets to work from wherever they want, fine. So the first thing that we did uh, is that we started by just asking our team, um, anyone that is currently based near one of our hubs, bear in mind, we've also got people that are already distributed in another um, country. So we asked you know, those team members, how do you do their best work? And it turns out that most of them say they want two things. One, they want to come in roughly two to three days into some kind of um, office hub, not five days uh, out of the working week that they want to be able to choose which days they come in and so sort of bonus that they ideally want their colleagues to be there when they are. And I think that is the issue that many employers are confronted with today, which is how do you give people flexibility while also ensuring that people don't ultimately end up missing each other, sort of getting the worst of both worlds. So that's where we decided that the best way to deliver on what our team want today is to provide choice, but to be very clear about what those choices are. And it's really two choices. For individuals, we give them the ability to choose whether they want to be remote first or hybrid first. Now, those two choices effectively mean, do you want to, you know, not have any expectation to ever come into our office hub at all, which also means that you will not get equal access to some benefits um, that might be tied to the office. For example, you know, just having a desk uh, there for you when you when you are when you're there, uh, instead having to you know um, go to communal areas, for example. Um, so there's a tiny sort of implication of between those choices what you're actually getting in return. Um, and number two, on a team level, uh, we give teams the choice which two days 
um, they want to um, come in for those people that choose hybrid first. Individuals and team leaders, they tell us both um, of these choices and we're going to organize our hub accordingly. So that's early days, obviously. We're experimenting with this and we're not going to say like this is, you know, what we're going to do always and forever <laughs> because we recognize we still haven't figured this out either. But for us right now, providing an environment where people ultimately have choice, but that's, the choice is very well defined, that is what has currently uh, gotten the best response from our team. And it's what so far has worked best. Now, Tempo listed Juro as the stop, the top startup to work for in the UK in 2022. That's such an exciting recognition. Could you talk to us about how Juro made it to the list? What about Juro's culture is attracting competitive talent? So I get this question um, a lot. Uh, I want to start by saying we had no influence in uh, where we placed. It was actually... Um, us who found out just on the day that it was publicly announced, so we didn't get like a prior warning or anything. We were um, as as surprised as I think everybody um, else. We we're obviously very positively surprised. But when we <laughs> um, when we asked the team at Tempo, um, they actually gave us a relatively simple answer: is that we were one of very few companies that was actually working towards creating a great culture like a product. So I think mm -hmm. companies have, you know, somebody responsible for culture or, you know, have, you know, an idea that they want to create a great and inclusive work environment, whatever, right? Those are, those are statements that are relatively common in the, the working world, um, but they're also super blurry. So typically nobody really reads anything into this. And I think the fact that we, number one, internally are actually quite clear on what we believe a great culture to be. Mm -hmm. and what tangible things we can actually do to measure what great is and how we work towards this, uh, especially this is by way of our value proposition, um, that actually leads us to be able to treat the company itself almost like a product itself. And that's also how I see my role. The company builds a great product. I help to build a great company. And the way that I do that is... You know, nowhere near what I think a real product manager does. But the approach is more or less the same. We think of the product like the employee experience and our employees like our users. And because we've been quite transparent, um, our handbook is public, it's out there, our careers page is public. We're generally quite vocal about, you know, when we put something out and we're proud of it. Um, I think the fact that we've done that, this was quite novel and I think uh, a little bit ahead of a lot of other startups at around our stage, Series A, B, especially during the pandemic. And that's why they um, uh, awarded us that um, that honor. Obviously, that puts a target on our back. Um, <laughs> just as much. So for this year, um, perhaps very ambitious, but like our, our ambition for this year is to be able to defend that title. And I think one thing that you highlighted was that you guys are able to define what culture you're looking for and what candidates want, and you're able to implement it. And I think those three components, companies might be better at one than the other, but it is hard to kind of find the balance of doing all three well. So you wrote an awesome blog article called Employee Benefits, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, where you dive into kind of some of those buzzwords around employee benefits and what candidates are looking for today. What types of perks and benefits are attractive to top talent in the UK? What does Juro offer and how do you implement them in an impactful way? Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot of work on this, especially in the past um, six months. And this all relates to um, the value proposition that I just, just mentioned earlier. Really, the balance that we want to, to strike of which perks and benefits are a part is that um, we want our people to you know, deliver great results. Um, but in return, what's the thing that we offer as, as a counter? And what we want to offer in turn is stability. Effectively saying, if you do great work here, you will have um, stability as far as that can go. And oftentimes startups aren't really seen for stability, right? Startups are a little bit of a wild west. You kind of go there thinking, you know, maybe in six months, it's an entirely different company, or maybe I have to look for another job. We really thought that, you know, uh, does it have to be like this or could we differentiate ourselves as a, as a company that says, you know, as far as, you know, the VC backed SaaS startup world goes, we can actually provide really stable um, environment. 
Um, and why would we want to do this? Because we want our team to be resilient. If we're a fast growing business, it's going to get a rocky ride the entire time. It's not always going to be um, great and smooth sailing. Basically, never is going to be. So the best thing that you can have is a team that's not going to jump ship every single time the ride gets bumpy. So how can we do that? By effectively offering stability on four things, compensation, benefits, environment, and growth opportunities. Now, if we're talking about benefits specifically, we found that um, you know what, what benefits that are most received, we talk to um, a lot of our team members. We actually have um, people personas, just like um, sales teams have customer personas. So we actually focused on a um, subset of our team members and asking you know, what resonates the most, what are the things that you're worried about, et cetera. And really what, what resonates the most is anything that provides stability, especially in three areas, health, family, and future. So for example, um, that can mean just a straightforward, like really good, like private health insurance. I think there's a bit of a recency effect here as well of like global pandemic and, you know, it's like healthcare is on, on a lot of folks' minds, um, but generally just stability on health for, for themselves and family. That doesn't just mean physical like health insurance. It also means things like um, mental health. That's why we have um, a mental health benefit that also extends to family members um, that they can have easily accessible um, coaching or, uh, or therapy. Um, it means things like uh, making sure that the healthcare provider we choose is actually um, the best in the market on gender affirmative care. Um, not just, you know, the cheapest one. So we really wanted to get this right. Um, and when we talk about inclusion or inclusivity, like that's not a separate thing that we do. It actually is something that we kind of sense check every single benefit against. When it comes to family, um, I think that's on our roadmap. Um, we are going to um, offer support uh, around fertility treatments because um, that's a thing that is completely individual for every um, couple, every partnership. Uh, when you want to start a family, we offer um, separate holidays for going on a honeymoon, all these things, just to give people a sense of stability when they start a family or already have um, a family, things like nursery schemes, like enhanced equal parental leave, um, foster care leave, adoption leave, all these things figure in there. And then the last thing is uh, stability on future. I think the one thing that we've seen that actually surprised us was that um, people are thinking way earlier about buying a house, like getting a bit of real estate. We didn't, we, we thought that, you know, maybe somebody who's sort of in their mid thirties thinks about this. Absolutely not the case. People who are, you know, 25, like early mid twenties, they're already thinking about these things. And one of the first things they, they, um, consider is okay you know how can this company um, actually help me to get you know to my first piece of um, like my first flat um, or uh, help me actually build up a portfolio etc so a lot of the other benefits that we are um, due to roll out in the next six months again provide stability on these sort of big life purchases the moments that matter what we call milestones um, and that's also how our benefits are clustered in, in six categories. If anybody's more interested, we have that also publicly available on our handbook. But really, stability we found resonates the most with candidates that apply to us, which they call out before we even ask, and with the people who are in the business today. And I think the, that shows in the fact that our average tenure is quite a bit above the average in SaaS businesses of our state. Thomas, thank you so much for sharing that framework. I feel like that's such a treasure chest of wisdom for people that are listening to this. Now, obviously, as you kind of mentioned, investing in employees is a big priority for Juro. So talk to us about Juro's approach to encouraging and fostering employee progression and growth mapping. Yeah. The way that we do this is by just defining clearly what the give and get relationship is here. So what do we expect and what will you get in return? What we expect... I sound like a broken record, but it is results. Um, if the results aren't there, progression and growth just will simply not be a, 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 an option for, for somebody. We will not reward a person for, you know, having tried so hard. Um, that sounds brutal sometimes, but I think one thing that is important for us is to really define you know, what kind of place we are, but also what kind of place we are not. I think people do appreciate this. A lot of people that actually come to us when they have um, conversations, uh, sort of initial phone screens with us, they basically say, you know, progression, you know, I've hit a glass ceiling, a person who was there, you know, 
longer than me got promoted first because they were promoted based on tenure. We're not going to promote people based on how long they've been with the business. We promote them based on, you know, what value they've delivered um, for the business. But obviously we don't just care about this. We obviously care also about how people deliver those results by how I don't mean, you know, where they deliver that work from, you know, being, you know, as, as we've established, like, isn't what we care about, but we care about the values, the, the ways of working that they do. For example, we would um, not consider somebody for promotion in, let's say, a sales team if they hit their targets, but they did it by stealing other people's leads. Right? So the what and the how are two axes that are equally important. Now, what is somebody going to get in return uh, when they deliver both of these things? They can expect quarterly opportunities to progress. We have quarterly um, reviews. It's not an annual cycle. It's not a half yearly cycle. At the end of every quarter, we do have a conversation. By that, I mean managers have conversations with their direct reports, full 360 reviews, so also peer um, feedback on how we think they have delivered on both of these axes. And with each of these conversations, a salary bump, for example, could actually be part of that um, discussion. That is why we uh, tend to um, give smaller um, pay bumps or um, smaller promotions to people, um, perhaps like some, two, sometimes three times a year, rather than having this sort of like heavy annual um, cycle where you've got like this tiny window and then uh, never again. And what, you know, progression looks like is very clearly defined in what we call um, career maps. Uh, this is effectively, you know, a, a career framework that is defined for every role at Juro. What are the levels that you can go to? Where does it branch off between individual contributor and manager? And what are our expectations of the skills you have to exhibit at every point? Again, just very clear documentation, very clearly saying, what do we expect? What do you get in return? Now, you have done an amazing job of building a transparent process for candidates and giving them the resources to know what to expect from the company. Like you mentioned, the Juro handbook that's just public, the transparency of the interview process, the blog post you've written. What advice do you have for developing strong talent teams and creating a successful hiring process and candidates experience, especially for startups? I would say three things. Number one, take your time to discover the problem. So why do you need a role? How does it connect to the targets that you want to achieve? What are you trying to actually solve here? And the number one issue that I've seen in, in businesses that is that they overhire or put in other words, try to hire their way out of a problem. <laughs> and that I think comes from a lack of correct discovery. Um, any agency, talent agency will feel this, this pain as well when the, when the client um, says, you know, I want this person. And then sort of as they see more and more candidates, like basically the conversation changes and says, like, actually, I need this person or that person. Like everything changes and we start again. That is a massive risk to business growth because you don't have the time in a company that wants to be on a unicorn trajectory to, you know, wait two months of, you know, discovering what you what you want first and then completely changing course. So the way that you can mitigate this risk is by being extremely um, strategic on the roles that you have on your hiring roadmap. And in fact, I think the, the, the reason why uh, I think our talent team is particularly um, strong on this is because we have very express um, permission or, or mandate rather to say no, if we don't think a role makes a very logic connection to here's our top line objectives, here are the key results, here's the kind of things that, you know, I need to get those key results. And here's why all the other op op options that I have to get to those key results other than hiring somebody are not possible or won't entirely solve the problem. And so many times, like not, not um, all that much um, now, but oftentimes, you know, it turns out that actually the problem isn't capacity. It might be efficiency or you can tweak something um, something else. That's how we've been able to be really quite frugal in who we hire. And I think that's a, my biggest advice, I would say, to create successful hiring process. Know why you're hiring in the first place. And really, if there isn't a strong case to be made, um, position yourself in a way in the business um, to say, you know, this might not be the best way, or this might be a slightly different role, or maybe we should try something else for us to, to do that. And I think in the hiring process, there would be two more things I would, I would um, 
uh, recommend that, that I found to be very useful. Um, just set clear SLAs for your talent team, what they're supposed to deliver. If you're saying come back to candidates within five working days or less, do that. <laughs> um, set it in your in your ATS um, to set a little uh, mark. I think our, the ATS we use is Leva, and it actually shows when when somebody hasn't hit that uh, SLA when the last candidate interaction is overdue. Um, be very vocal about that. Candidates should see you have, should have it in every email template saying like, "This is when I will get back to you. If I don't, call me out on it, please." And then number three, the, the thing that has put um, you know I think the cherry on top for us in terms of candidate experience just set expectations on what happens in an interview. I think there's a lot of hesitation to kind of give people the answer to their questions um, beforehand in the interview. We found it hasn't actually made that much of a difference. We've told people really in quite a lot of detail in every one of our hiring process, what they can expect, what kind of questions they can expect to be asked, what structure of answers we think is particularly valuable. We have found that the people who are really good in the business today, they've been able to pick up on that and turn it into something um, that is useful. People that aren't a fit, they actually just kind of breeze past that. Um, so I would say share all of that information beforehand, plus give the transparency on why somebody has made it afterwards. Just taking a little bit of extra time to write two or three bullet points that a candidate can take away tangibly to say, oh, this is why they moved forward with somebody else. Some people will be salty. I've gotten a couple <laughs> of angry emails uh, over time. Um, but the vast majority of people are like, nobody ever gives me feedback if I don't make it. So thanks <laughs> for doing this. And then capture those people and see if you can nurture them over time because they might be a great fit. Thomas, it's such an admirable thing when companies can be so transparent about the details of their processes and provide information that isn't typical because like, with that transparency comes with accountability. And I think that level of transparency means the company is willing to be accountable. So builds a lot of trust, very admirable. What are some of the hiring challenges your team has faced? Inflation, <laughs> like everybody else. So um, really, um, especially in SaaS sales, I think um, the expectations on compensation have shot up a lot. And sometimes that is really quite hard to swallow for a business because it, um, you know, as, as a company, uh, even if you're in a, in a, in a good cash position, like, like we are we've just raised our series B, that's, that's great to have, uh, you know, money in the bank at the beginning of an economic downturn. Um, but obviously, you know, you're planning runway, um, you have, you know, only so many resources and you're planning these with certain assumptions of how much somebody is going to cost. Uh, especially if you're hiring, you know, engineers or um, account executives, business development representatives, those tend to be your most repeated um, roles in, in a SaaS business. And if those suddenly jump up by like 30% uh, in terms of what they're, what they're looking for, it does change the calculation. So finding people and, 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 and just pivoting really on the spot, making fast decisions on saying, okay, like what level of salary is the kind of candidate that we're looking for right at what level in our career map for example you know how much more do they cost now and then only targeting for those people that's been a challenge and it has led to um us having to actually refactor a couple of roles um that um we kind of started with at the beginning of this quarter for example that you know about one month and we were like are we looking for like something else here is this one in two roles uh, Etc. So it has kind of broken for us uh, a little bit. We're now back on uh, on track, but I think we've cha faced more or less the same challenges uh, as everybody else. Plus, um, there's I think a certain skittishness in the market at the moment. A lot of people don't want to don't want to move, uh, which is understandable, of course. I'm also not gonna uh, not gonna jump ship um, anytime soon. But you partner this with the summer slump, which some people think is probably a myth, but I, I've always found that summer is a little bit uh, lighter on um, on applications. I think that kind of comes together and it creates a really, really um, hot market in terms of candidate power. Uh, and you really have to stand out as a business. And we're facing that challenge just as anyone else does. Now, Juro is one of my favorite examples of company doing employer branding correctly. What is your advice for how companies should go about building a strong employer brand? I would say three things. Start simple. Start with what you've actually done and finish off by what you're going to do. So uh, taking these in turn, like starting simple, 
nobody expects a business to have like a shiny, glossy careers page. Our careers page is still in Notion. Now, at some point, we're going to go away from this and actually rebuild like a native, like great careers page in our um, on our website. But um, the reason why we've made this decision in the first place is because A, at the time that I joined Juro, 15 people had a very basic careers page, um, but just didn't have the capacity to like build out um, something big. And those out of the box careers pages that most applicant tracking systems offer, pretty, pretty bland. You don't really have an opportunity to actually showcase your brand um, all that much. So we said, you know, what's the easiest cost-effective way of doing this using a tool we already have? In our case, it was Notion. Um, and using that, we've basically come up until this far, just um, going really quite simple and saying, you know, we focus on giving a lot of detail in our job specs. Um, we're going to give a lot of transparency on everything else that's happening in the company, public handbook, again, in Notion. Um, so th these things, they don't cost much at all, but they do help profile yourself as an authentic employer. The second thing I would say is, you know, start by saying you know, what you have done. I'm generally not a big fan of uh, putting out, you know, something like a diversity statement uh, somewhere at the top of a, uh, or the bottom of a, of a job spec and then kind of calling, like patting yourself on the shoulder and call it, uh, calling it quits. Like what I care and I think what, what candidates, especially candidates that aren't um, so the majority straight white um, males, um, what people will look for before they ever click that apply button is they will try and find out as much about you um, and what you're actually doing as a company um, that makes them feel seen and included. And, and you've got to be really sure that information is out there. So you got to say, what is it that you have done? And sort of in combination, what is it that you haven't done and what you are going to do? That's why, you know, we put a lot of information out there, why I write quite consistently um, posts, why we're quite active on social media and saying, okay, here's what we are doing for um, women at Juro. Here's what we're doing for um, people of faith. Here's what we're going to do for um, people with um, neurodiverse city so like you you got to just be clear about like also where your blind spots are like i am not going to tackle all of this all together um the really minimum of a company is that you're not going to discriminate um, against employees um but really you you might be implicitly um excluding folks from things and that can be something as simple as you know working parents if you're a flexible employer but your entire day is booked out with meetings mm -hmm. you are being exclusive to folks who are you know trying to raise a kid um and suddenly two things that have nothing to do with each other at first surface level which is you know amount of meetings everybody's always overwhelmed <laughs> with meetings and the inclusivity aspect of this so um we publish stats we publish things that we're doing in the business to minimize meetings and how we think that actually is more inclusive towards a certain group of, of people. We publish our gender pay gap. We say how many um, non-male team members there currently are in the business. And we also say where we're falling short um, just as much because we think that people who join us deserve to know that. And if they say, you know, this is not for, for, for me because, you know, it's something that you don't offer as a deal breaker for me, fair enough. Maybe we might be able to offer this in the future, but at least we've spoken the truth and we're not going to waste somebody else's time or our time um, by, you know, dragging them through an interview process when it turns out that, you know, actually, you know, we don't offer X, Y, or Z. Last question for you, Thomas. At Solvable, we're all about what drives purpose and meaning for people at work. So I'd love to know what drives purpose and meaning for you at Juro. Ooh, um, my... Um, boss, who's our CEO, co-founder um, as well. Um, he's had that conversation with me as well. Um, we actually do this for um, for every person um, at Juro. Once they start within their first week, we have um, what we call like, clarifying somebody's motivators. So what is it that drives you? What gets you up in the morning? Where is it that you want to get to um, with this job? Like what do you want to get out of it? And what are your deal breakers? So what, should, what warning signals should we watch out for that are going to make you leave? Um, so the last time that um, I answered that, and I think what is true for me today is what really drives purpose for me at work is being able to build a healthy group of people that enjoy what they're doing and that feel like they're growing 
I think going back all the way to the to the beginning, you know, the company builds the product. I or I I probably shouldn't say this, but I don't care that much about most of the products, right? And unless you're um, curing cancer with your product, you're you know you're sort of changing the world. But you know, plenty of businesses and plenty of ways that um, you, you've got out there to like change the world in some form or fashion. So you know, whilst I obviously um, really care about you know our mission at Juro, for example, I also cared about the missions that um, Paddle and Algolia had um, before. But really, more than that, I care about you know building a place that has a great culture and is a healthy company that then also builds a good product. And especially, you know, up until um, my team kind of grew in the beginning of the year, I still hired about 70% of the people that are in the business today. We grew from 15 to 90 in the two years that I, um, that I, that I've been here and just seeing most of these people still being with the business doing good work, actually enjoying like um, being with each other. I think that's that's the thing that, that that gets me up in the morning, being able to continue to do that. And, you know, maybe with things like this podcast and, um, you know, interacting with other people, leaders in the business, being able to maybe spread the word a little bit and give people inspiration based on what we're doing that might not work for them, but maybe it gives them an idea for what they could do. You know, that that's the most fulfilling thing. For, for everyone me. listening, Thomas has some super insightful and refreshing perspectives on leading people, talent and candidate experiences as you've gotten to hear on the podcast today. So definitely take a look at some of his posts and writing if you haven't already. Thomas, thank you so much for being on with us today. And thank you all for listening to Architects of Contemporary Hiring.